The third season of Ozark has 18 Emmy nominations. I'm Riley Chow of Gold Derby here with Ben Semenoff, who is nominated for directing the sixth episode titled Sukasa e Mikasa. Now, what stands out about that one from a directorial perspective? Wow, from a directorial perspective. I mean, I think from a directorial perspective, anytime that you're, you're working on a mid-season episode, you're always challenged with trying to keep the audience engaged. I mean, I think... I think we all experience this as audience members that shows often in a season kick off um, the season with a bang. And then they have to pace themselves, uh, particularly episodes three through seven, um, in order to really give the audience a nice payoff when you get to eight, nine, and 10. And so I think when you're right smack in the middle from a directorial standpoint, it's trying to create something that's still engaging, um, that, uh, that the audience enjoys and, and obviously propels them uh, into the, the finale, uh, the last three episodes or four episodes. This episode has a couple big set pieces, so to speak. There's the opening therapy scene, and then there's the you know, literal explosion at the end. Can you talk about those ones? Yeah, it's a nice, it's a nice bookend, right, for the, for the episode. Um, I know the writers were really excited about the idea of starting off with such a, uh, a significant, impactful uh, scene right at the, at the head of, of the episode, which, you know, it presents a challenge in order to then uh, keep the rest of the episode engaging and, and not at that same level. We start at a 10, then I need to bring it back down and slowly build again so that we can reach that climax and, and have a and have an enjoyable kind of payoff at the end with with Julia nearly, you know, nearly losing her life. Now you're Ruth, 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 oh, Ruth not sorry. Julia, but <laughs> that's true. You're normally the show's camera operator. Why was this the episode from the third season for you? Um, well, there was a bit of a reworking of the of the season. I think I was originally slated to do episode eight. Um, and at some point they, uh, they looked to try to economize, I guess, and they decided to have Alec do the last four episodes and they looked at episode five and six for me as an alternative to the episode I was originally scheduled to do. Uh, and they, they gave me an, an opportunity to decide which I liked, uh, and which I wanted to do. I actually was kind of keen on five. I thought it had a really great, um, ending with the horse uh but uh, ultimately episode six was i think a little bit more story driven uh character driven episode it was it was a little bit more uh centered around marty and wendy's uh marriage kind of hitting this you know this this wall and and collapsing a little bit and and of course it had some really big uh set piece scenes like that finale scene so I think that everybody, including myself, felt more comfortable uh, with me taking on that episode. You've been with the show for three seasons. Basically, you weren't part of the pilot, or so to speak, but you have been there pretty much ever since. I understand that kind of a condition of you coming onto the show was getting the chance to direct. Has that always been kind of your long-term career goal? I don't know that it's always been, but uh, I would say for the past decade, I've found myself operating uh, a camera on shows. And for people that you know aren't super familiar with the hierarchy on shows, a camera operator tends to be pretty close to the the pulse of what's happening on set. Um, I found I found over time that I was I was connecting a little bit more with what the director was involved with, what the decisions he was making in terms of telling story as opposed to what the cinematographer was doing. And so um, I guess I resigned myself to either getting an opportunity to direct or continuing to operate for the rest of my career. So I would say probably about uh, six years ago when I was on uh, the first season of Leftovers, I kind of made this conscious decision that uh, I was going to chase this dream of directing. Um, and I pursued it uh, a couple times unsuccessfully <laughs> until uh, fortunately Jason gave me uh, this great opportunity last season on uh, episode 209 and then again this season. Yeah, that was your directorial debut. You were not on the Emmy ballot last year. You're on it this year. Now you're nominated. 
obviously things have paid off, but I'm wondering how you're able to kind of convince them that not only would you understand things from the technical side, but also that you'd be able to manage the whole crew and oversee actors and their performances? That's a good question. Uh, I actually sat down with um, Mimi Leader, who's also nominated. Uh, uh, I can't remember. I think it was sometime just before they started the first season of Morning Show. And I think I had just finished uh, the season two episode and she asked a similar question and she said, how do you, how did you learn how to direct? And I said to her by watching you, uh, by watching all these great directors that I've worked with over the years and, um, and leaning in and kind of listening to the way they're interacting with crew outside of my department and the way they're interacting with cast, how they're giving notes, the choices they're making. And of course, uh, studying those choices later uh, in whatever's released to see how how those choices uh, worked, whether we we did work that was unnecessary because they ultimately didn't use shots, um, and just evaluating everything that I've experienced each each show, each episode that I've been involved in, and then ultimately finding a person that was willing to to believe that I had the capacity. Jason and I. Uh, worked together on his second feature film, uh, Family Fang. We had a great working relationship, um, really great collaboration, and and kind of like a really interesting mutual respect, I guess. Um, and he originally offered me the uh, position on the first season of Ozark, which I passed purely because I didn't want to be away from my wife and kids for such a long period of time. So when he returned to me and asked uh, if I would consider coming back, I, I said, you know, I, I mean, not coming back, but consider, reconsider the, the position. And I said, um, well, you know, uh, this is where I want to go with my career. I want to direct. And he instantly, he instantly was a champion of that idea. He, 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 there was no hesitation. I, I so I, I can only assume that he saw, the capacity in me to do the job. Now you did full seasons of The Affair, Do No Harm, The Leftovers with Mimi Leader. Why was Ozark the one that you settled down with for multiple years? That's a, that's a good question. Ultimately it came, it's because of this opportunity that I was given. Um, each year, uh, each season that you referenced, The uh, Leftovers, Do No, uh, not Do No Harm, but Leftovers and The Affair, uh, subsequent to my work uh, there, I would reach out to the showrunner and say, hey, um, any chance that I can direct next season? And for whatever reason, political um, lack of confidence in my ability, whatever the reason was, it didn't work out. And so um, I guess there wasn't a lot of um, motivation for me to return. Leftovers went to Austin again, like I mentioned earlier, I've been trying to, at the time, not travel as much. So when they said they were going to Austin and directing wasn't in my future there, uh, I passed on that. Um, so I think, uh, I think here with Ozark, there's a bunch of reasons why I stayed around. Um, number one was the opportunity to direct. But uh, number two, I, I, you know, I have to say, I just, I, I love the cast, the crew uh, on the show. It, it is a home away from home. It's a second family. And I love working with, with Bateman. I mean, I think we do some really great work together. Um, and so I, you know, I can't, I, I can't imagine not continuing to work with him in the future. Now, what are the rules of Ozark camera wise and how did you change things up once you joined? Well, when I joined, um, I think they were still trying to figure things out a little bit. Um, uh, Pepe was the cinematographer at the time. I think he had left the show. Cutchins was coming in on the second block. Uh, I was coming in just after that. Um, and I had just worked on the night of. And I know that Jason was a big fan of the night of. Uh, I learned an incredible amount about my craft, both as an operator and uh, director, um, on that show between Igor Martinovic and Steve Zalian. Uh, it was a masterclass in, um, in camera composition, in camera movement, and in directing. So I knew going into um, Ozark 
uh, I've had at that time a zillion conversations with Jason about the night of, and I knew that that he was looking to kind of draw from some of those aesthetic sensibilities. And so when I came in, I, I tried to continue to make the camera more deliberate. Um, you know, there's a, a tendency in TV to create eye candy for the sake of eye candy. And it's not really, that's not really what I'm interested in doing. To me, there's a beautiful tension between the times when the camera isn't moving and when the times when the camera's moving. It's almost more poignant for the camera not to move sometimes. So really, when I talk about camera and movement, uh, both from an operating and a directing standpoint on that show, it's all about being very specific and deliberate. What are we seeing? Um, what are we not seeing? Because that's sometimes more interesting. I often talk with um, the, the the boom operator on the show. Uh, he and I have a have a really great relationship, and uh, I often say this to him. And he goes, "Yeah, it's not about um, it's about the cards you leave on the table." You know, that's really what um, makes directorial choices interesting. You were nominated at the SOC Awards from the Society of camera operators for the night of, and then also for both seasons of Ozark that have been eligible. Now, assessing camera work is not really something that we do in awards conversations because there is no category at the Emmys or the Oscars. So I'm wondering, like, what's your take in terms of assessing camera work? Like, what should we be looking for? It's a difficult question to answer. Um, there's a wide range of camera operators out there some of which are relatively passive in their involvement in choice, you know, uh, compositional choices and movement. Um, to me, what I find interesting at those awards is oftentimes the, sh the shows that win are the ones that uh, the camera never rests for more than a couple seconds before a cut. Um, so if I were looking for really, if I were looking to evaluate a camera operator or camera work, I'd always be looking to see how does a camera operator perform when the shot has to last five minutes. And it doesn't even have to, it doesn't necessarily have to be a steady cam shot or anything too glamorous. It just has to be, what are the, what are the, what are the timing choices? What, what are the, what are the decisions this operator is making in order to make himself invisible? Because ultimately I think from both a, a operating and a directing standpoint, my goal is to is for the audience member never ever to to think about the construct of what they're watching. I want them never to realize that uh, there was a, a human behind the camera at all. Uh, I want them almost to be hypnotized into a world, uh, a fantasy world. So when I watch good camera work, it's oft I often realize that it was good because ten minutes later I go, oh my god, like I've totally forgotten that I'm watching a television show. I feel like a big turning point was with True Detective in 2014. They had that six minute shot that ended the fourth episode and then Kerry Fukunaga, he won the Emmy, Chris McGuire, he won the SOC award. How much do you agree with that assessment that that really changed the game? Yeah, no, I, I would agree that they pushed the limits uh, significantly on that show. I, I thought that show kind of did exactly what I was talking about. It, it, the camera moved in a very deliberate way. I think a lot of us, I think if you're on set, you know, I have to give props to David Fincher. He, I, I think stylistic choices that he has aligned himself with have kind of seeped into every corner of premium cable filmmaking and, and feature filmmaking. Uh, True Detective, House of Cards, uh, and I think oftentimes you'll find on a, on, on a show like Ozark or House of Cards or True Detective or, or anything of the like, um, you'll find people referencing his, his approaches uh, to camera movement and composition. I'm, I'm personally a huge fan and I am a, a Fincherite. I don't know what the proper word would be, but. Yeah, I feel like every show in the last seven years has looked like House of Cards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, can you relate this back to Ozark? Because with Ozark, you've got all these very long takes, but I feel like it's not gimmicky like I see in so many other shows where it feels like it's so ingrained in the show because you don't use it for just the big action pieces. You use it for kind of more relatively. Yeah. No, 
well. Exactly. Um, yeah, it, a long take doesn't necessarily have to be showy. It shouldn't be showy. Um, I mean, that that might again be a Fincher approach or a Spielberg approach. Um, I'm a Steadicam operator, so you know, early on in a Steadicam operator's career, all you want to do is move the camera. Uh, you want to do these massive shots. You're on set and you're pitching. Well, I can go up the stairs and I can. And some people never, I guess, some operators per, perhaps never lose that. For me, uh, not due to laziness, because I, I can I can wear the Steadicam uh, for as long as anybody wants me to wear it. But from a story standpoint. Um, to me, it's not interesting. I kind of, I kind of draw a comparison between, uh, you know, music and camera movement. Um, you know, w within music, you're constantly creating tension, and then you're releasing or relieving that tension. Um, I, I, I think about it the same way with camera movement. Um, I set a frame, and I allow the tension to build until until it's unbearable maybe i never break the maybe that maybe the relief that the audience member gets is purely cutting to the next scene um and the 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 movement of the camera which again is is a very conscious deliberate thought out process on set um should only be to support what's ha what's happening or the perspective of the character you're trying to connect with um, and, and, you know, leaving things out off camera are super interesting. I mean, one of the scenes that, that I, I love from my episode that did that was the scene with um, Helen and, and her daughter. And it was the, it's the night after, basically, the morning after, so to speak. And, you know, um, her daughter is is on her phone and not giving Helen any attention. And I, I, I didn't even shoot Helen's close up for that scene because I wanted, I wanted it to feel that she was being diminished by her daughter. I wanted to build the tension to the point where Helen snatches the phone out of her daughter's hand and gets her daughter's attention. In fact, the second shot in that scene is a shot where Helen's in the background, still out of focus. I wanted, I, I intentionally wanted to diminish mom as so many parents have felt and so those kinds of decisions are are you know constantly on my mind whether it's something that i'm directing or whether i'm the operator and i can make a suggestion to the director that they might embrace yeah. uh, thanks for these insights we have many more ozark interviews on our youtube channel and you can go to goldderby.com to make your own emmy predictions my pleasure thanks for having me